conversations. Sometimes you get engrossed in them, other times you get trapped and zone out. But you can't tell when a verbal exchange between two people, friends, siblings, parents, or anyone, might be the last. Well, Barbara Betts didn't know either when her 11-year-old son Patrick yelled out to save some pizza for him as he ran out of a restaurant with his friend to go see a basketball match on January 20th, 1988. But those were pretty much Patrick's last words, and Barbara, after 36 years having passed with no sign of her son, holds on to these words for dear life. Patrick left to watch a basketball game in Upland, California, but he never came back, not even after three decades had passed. What's so bizarre about this case is that there's no solid clues or evidence or trails that could lead to information. But there were a few breadcrumbs that pointed investigators in the right direction. But would they be enough? Patrick's case is confusing, eerie, and infuriating because many people believe the police didn't handle the case correctly. Friends and family believe that if the circumstances were different, the outcome would have been too. If you're new here, welcome to True Crime Stories. I post new true crime cases every week narrated by yours truly, with none of that AI narration crap that's running rampant these days. So if you want to see some good old-fashioned true crime cases, hit that subscribe button. It's totally free and keeps you up to date with my future videos. But Patrick Sean Betts, who normally went by his middle name, was born on June 21st, 1976 to parents Dennis and Barbara Betts, who lived in Upland, California. Patrick attended Sierra Vista Elementary School, and his mom, Barbara, defined him as a happy-go-lucky kid. Friends described Patrick as tough, mischievous, and playful. But he was also street smart. He wasn't gullible or naive, although he always had a smile on his face. Patrick was also very obedient and helpful around the house and at a local Radio Shack store that he loved to visit. He was like any other kid his age, but he was vibrant, kind, and genuine. From a young age, Patrick was a lovable boy. He could be a bit mischievous at times, but what more do you expect from a young kid having fun and developing his personality? Patrick also had a wicked sense of humor, which is what drew in many of his friends. Patrick's childhood best friend was Kevin. Since their homes were literally across the street from each other, Kevin and Patrick soon became inseparable. Now, Kevin unfortunately had medical problems, and he was very isolated, not having a lot of people who would hang out with him but Patrick and Kevin very quickly became as close as two kids could possibly be. Patrick saw Kevin as more than just an isolated kid with issues that weren't in his control. This goes to show that Patrick was a wonderful boy who looked beneath the surface and was ready to step up for anyone. It's so heartwarming to see Patrick and Kevin's friendship because it was a bond built on genuine trust and respect for each other. Patrick's favorite activities included riding a skateboard and playing video games and baseball, typical 80s kid stuff. Kevin's dad actually coached the Little League baseball team in Upland, and Patrick's love for baseball grew even more once he befriended Kevin. We all had that one favorite thing at some point in our childhood, whether it be an action figure, a stuffed animal, or even a toy truck that we couldn't sleep without. For Patrick, his blanket was a source of comfort. He cuddled up with it every night and wouldn't sleep without it. Now, I mentioned Patrick's blanket because it'll become a point of interest in just a moment. As in January of 1988, when Patrick was just 11 years old, he vanished into thin air and was never seen again. Patrick left his family in a deep and dark pit of despair, sadness, and hopelessness, and no one could have imagined what could have happened to him. January 20th, 1988 was a normal day for the Betts family. 11-year-old third grader Patrick and his mom Barbara and his older sister Pamela were hanging out at a local pizza place called Pizza Chalet. This was a place in Upland where everybody got together to have a good time with their families, and that's exactly what the Betts family was doing. Patrick asked his mom for change and went to go play video games in the built-in arcade that was in the back of Pizza Chalet. It turns out Patrick was good friends with the pizza place's owner's son, so he loved coming here to hang out in the arcade. It was a recent friendship, though, and Barbara didn't know this new friend too well. While Barbara was ordering some pizza, Patrick then proceeded to go ask his mom for permission to go to a local basketball game at Upland High School, and his friend, aka the pizza owner's son, was going to go with him. Barbara didn't seem to mind, and she let her son go. 
As Patrick was making his way out of Pizza Chalet, he turned around and asked Barbara to save some pizza for him. Barbara smiled and assured Patrick, and then he stepped out the door. At that moment, Barbara never thought that this would be the last exchange between her and her son, and now she remembers every second, every instant of that fateful day, because after that, Patrick was gone. It was the 1980s, and it was normal for parents to let their young children walk to and from places alone and it was a safe enough place to let kids stay out and play with their friends. The concept of locking doors was still new, and people would often hitchhike with strangers too and be completely okay. But that was then, and this is now, and things have dramatically changed in the span of just a few decades. Anyway, the basketball game that Patrick and his friend wanted to see was going to be held in Chino, almost eight miles away from Upland. So the boys had no choice but to return to Pizza Chalet, disheartened that they couldn't see the game they were so excited about. I'm not sure why they were so excited that they just ran out the front doors if the game were taking place two doors down, but I guess they just didn't realize how far away that high school really was. But the gloom didn't last too long because the boys decided to kill time by playing more video games at the pizzeria. In fact, Patrick was seen in Pizza Chalet playing video games with the owner's son until 9 p.m. that evening. It's never mentioned where Patrick's mom had gone during this time, but I guess she just ordered the pizza to go and headed home to wait on Patrick to return. So by the time 9 p.m. rolled around, Patrick decided to call it a night and made his way back home. At least that was his plan, but Patrick never made it home. Everyone in the Betts family was highly concerned for Patrick as several hours passed by and he still wasn't home. They stayed up all night watching the front door, thinking that Patrick would walk in with a sheepish look on his face for being so late. But sadly, this wasn't the case. January 20th bled into January 21st, and that was when the Betts family finally reported Patrick as missing. You would think that Upland investigators would take Patrick's disappearance seriously, and a search would ensue in record time. But this sadly was the beginning of a long and infuriating tale of neglect and utter disinterest by detectives in finding 11-year-old Patrick. The police were of no help to the Betts family because they initially suggested Patrick was a runaway, and they proceeded to say that Patrick would return home, quote, when he got hungry. It's so unbelievable that law enforcement agencies did not for one second think that something terrible might have happened to Patrick. But it turns out there was a reason why the investigators thought that Patrick had decided to run away. See, Patrick, shortly before his disappearance, got into a fight with his classmate at school. Now, because there wasn't a lot of detail as to what the fight was about, we don't know whether it was a serious one or not. We don't know whether it was simply a quarrel between classmates, a scuffle breaking out in the cafeteria, a fight during practice or PE, but Patrick did have a date coming up which he had to show up for in juvenile court. But the Betts family didn't seem to believe this unreasonable theory. Patrick, up until his disappearance, wasn't even worried about his court date. He had no interest in running away, and certainly not because of some stupid fight. This is why it's believed that the fight between the classmates was not as serious as detectives thought it was. Although Patrick's disappearance definitely was. To add to the oddness, Patrick's belongings were still in the house. You would think that if an 11-year-old boy wanted to evade the law and run away, he would surely have taken his backpack, a few clothes, and some money, and other essentials or something, right? But Patrick's stuff was untouched. Even his comfort blanket that he couldn't sleep without was still in his room. If Patrick wanted to run away, then he definitely would have taken his blanket, but he didn't. But the police were not letting up. Officers were still convinced that Patrick had run away, and they assured his family that he would come home soon. But the thing is, Upland has a reputation for being an unsafe city. With a population of just over 78,000 people, Upland has a crime rate that's 3% higher than the national average. And that may not sound like a very significant number, but it certainly is. In simple terms, about five serious crimes occur each day in Upland, which is a relatively small town, all things considered. And that's a terrifying statistic. Knowing this, Patrick's disappearance becomes all the more chilling. Anyway, the investigators' actions in Patrick's disappearance were shocking and angering. The Betts family knew that there was nothing they could do besides look for Patrick by themselves, and they did. The Betts family, armed with missing person posters, went door to door and asked everyone whether they'd seen their little boy or not. 
The family even visited Pizza Chalet, the last place where Patrick was seen alive, and asked around for any information. And it's here that they finally found a clue. See, there was a beauty supply store near Pizza Chalet, and a woman working there apparently saw Patrick walking in with an older adolescent boy. Now, even though this was a promising lead, it wasn't very solid because the woman had a hard time recalling what she actually saw, and at one point she didn't even remember if she'd seen Patrick with someone or not. The Betts family thought that the older boy with Patrick was the pizzeria owner's son, but it couldn't be confirmed as the woman who reported seeing Patrick didn't know what the other boy looked like and couldn't cross-match his appearance with the pizza owner's son. So the Betts family were back to square one. At this point, the family was in turmoil. They tried to stay hopeful, but fear for Patrick's safety and his whereabouts consumed them. They were very frantic and terrified for Patrick, and they tried to persuade the detectives again that Patrick was not a runaway and that they needed to look deeply into his disappearance. And finally, the police agreed. But by the time the Upland investigators got involved in the case, four grueling months had passed since Patrick was initially reported missing. Time is of the essence in missing person cases, and this long span only makes things worse as the investigation progresses. Even though the Betts family was finally relieved that the detectives were involved and they would try to uncover the truth behind Patrick's disappearance, it was four months too late. See, statistics show that in disappearances, the first 48 to 72 hours are the most crucial. They hold the highest chance of finding the missing person, as evidence can disappear very quickly. Whether it's a child or a full-grown adult, after 72 hours, the chances of finding a missing person plunge at lightning speed, and unfortunately, hope was beginning to become lost, and the Betts family feared that Patrick would never make it back home. Patrick's disappearance was a huge question mark looming over everyone's heads. There were little to no leads in the case, and because it was originally assumed that Patrick was a runaway, his disappearance and case didn't get the public attention that it deserved. Shockingly, only a handful of articles were ever written in the papers on Patrick's disappearance, and there was no media attention because no one wanted to cover the story of a so-called runaway, which is so heartbreaking. To this day, there's very little information out there. But there are some weird occurrences that stood out to the Betts family, and it all started the day after Patrick went missing. See, Sierra Vista Elementary School received a very unsettling phone call a day after Patrick disappeared. The caller sounded like an older woman who claimed to be Patrick's grandmother. But what she went on to say was very eerie and bizarre. The woman on the phone stated that Patrick would no longer be coming to school since he was moving to Washington to live with her. When this detail came out, it led to even more confusion. It was later revealed that the caller was definitely not Patrick's grandmother. But there were some very disturbing details about this call. First of all, the caller knew the name of Patrick's school. Moreover, it was believed that the caller knew the Betts family too, because she knew that Patrick's grandmother lived in Washington. As a bit of background, Patrick's grandmother did live in Washington at one point, but she'd moved to California months before Patrick's disappearance. Patrick adored his grandmother and always took care of her because she was unfortunately diagnosed with cancer and was very weak and frail. Heartbreakingly, Patrick's grandmother eventually passed away with the painful knowledge that her grandchild still hadn't been found. The call left the Betts family feeling even more distressed because it seemed like the caller knew very private details about the Betts family. They even thought that Patrick was trying to reach out to them in some way. But since this case did take place back in 1988, Sadly, there was no way of tracking or IDing the call, and this soon hit a brick wall, much to the dismay of the Betts family. That wasn't the only alarming thing that happened, though. See, four months after the disappearance of Patrick, something happened that involved the pizza chalet, the very place where Patrick was the night that he disappeared. See, the owners of the pizzeria packed up in haste and left Upland permanently. It was believed that they went back to their hometown. When the Betts family got wind of this, they were understandably alarmed. Why would a well-managed and bustling business like Pizza Chalet close so suddenly, and that too right after Patrick's disappearance? The detail wasn't sitting well with them at all. When the police got involved in this, they fortunately did track the owners down. They'd moved from Upland to Los Angeles. But soon after the investigators reached them in LA, the owners left once again, 
this time for the Middle East, where they were originally from. Essentially, they fled the country, and many locals were beginning to believe that they did this because they realized the police were on to them. Of course, there's no solid evidence that the owners of the Pizza Chalet were involved in Patrick's disappearance. And considering the members of this family were Middle Eastern immigrants, it does make logical sense that they may have just wanted to travel back to their home country. And it's possible the timing was merely a coincidence. Personally, this whole situation seems incredibly suspicious. Because of this, the detectives couldn't question the owners or their son, as no one knew his name. This also led to another dead end, as the previous woman's statement about seeing Patrick with an older boy couldn't be corroborated. The Bats family's hope was brutally crushed. They felt as though they were stuck in a maze, and they couldn't find their way out. It's just so infuriating and saddening to think that the very limited leads in Patrick's case were leading to no answers. But that wasn't the end of the miserable road the Betts family was on, because the police decided to do something very odd and downright infuriating. Somehow, the Upland investigators were convinced that Patrick's older brother, who was 15 years old at the time of his younger brother's disappearance, was behind all of this. How the detectives got to this conclusion is still a mystery. Maybe because he was allegedly seen with an older boy that day? Who even knows? Maybe the police just wanted to pin Patrick's disappearance on someone, no matter who it was, and get done with the case, which is so upsetting. The thing is, there was no evidence for their claims. Patrick's brother even had an airtight alibi the night Patrick disappeared. See, Patrick's brother was away in San Francisco with his band, Manta, playing a show. He was seven hours away from Upland. He was on stage all night, according to his band members, and he couldn't possibly have been the one to make Patrick disappear. But this didn't stop the detectives from grilling the terrified 15-year-old boy. They unlawfully detained him and didn't inform his family of their intent to question him. By the time the Betts family got to the police station, the detectives had questioned Patrick's brother for over five hours, and he was in the midst of taking a polygraph test, which he failed, and then he was ordered by one of the officers to write out a confession. The Betts family was furious over the investigator's actions, and they demanded that they let him go as all the accusations were totally baseless. What's so heartbreaking about this instance is that Patrick's brother, who already was suffering from crippling anxiety, these days now suffers from PTSD after what the police did to him. This new diagnosis led to many people in the local community suspecting that the kid was hiding something, when in reality, he'd just been dealing with one of the most serious mental health disorders you could imagine. But the Betts family had one more very significant and equally upsetting encounter with the Upland investigators, and it occurred in 1991, over three years after Patrick was last seen. It was six in the morning when the Betts family was jolted awake by none other than Upland detectives. As they were trying their best to gain their bearings and get out of bed, they saw people in hazmat suits with bloodhounds surrounding their house. The police had a search warrant. Without warning, they flooded the Betts' home with officers and dogs. They searched the rooms and backyard for evidence, and unbelievably, investigators refused to tell the family why. The Betts family had no choice but to let detectives search their home until 8 or 9 p.m. that night, over 12 hours. It's mind-boggling that the Betts family's privacy was invaded so brutally, and the grieving family didn't get to know what was even going on until months had passed. Turns out that the police had received an anonymous tip stating that Patrick's remains were buried under the Betts family home. The investigators, without even confirming whether the tip was legit or not, ransacked the home without so much as a second thought. It's understandable to some extent as to why detectives decided to follow up on this tip, but the fact that they were so rude and ruthless about it is what's the real problem here. According to Patrick's sister, who was in the family home with her newborn twins at the time, the police were unapologetic, not kind or sympathetic at all, and it felt as if they were openly harassing the family, which is so unbelievable. Of course, nothing came up and the tip was obviously just a hoax. But again, Patrick's case had hit a dead end. Because this case was not publicized, it got very little attention and no media coverage. More than 30 years later, the only info on Patrick and his disappearance is a couple of lines and a photo on The Charlie Project missingkids.org, the Doe Network, and the California Department of Justice website. There are age-progressed photos of Patrick from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, though. But Patrick's case, or his picture rather, 
was once publicized, and it's considered the most exposure Patrick and his disappearance ever got. See, Patrick's photo, including those of 35 other missing and endangered children, were featured in Soul Asylum's music video for the song Runaway Train, which was released back in 1993. The reason for including 36 missing children in the Soul Asylum music video was a campaign of sorts to spread the word on these disappearances. Luckily, it was hugely successful, and out of the 36 missing kids, 26 were found. But even though Patrick's picture was in the music video, it didn't lead to him being found. Years after Patrick's case went cold, there was yet another bizarre incident that occurred. And this time, it involved Patrick's own nephew. Patrick's sister, Pamela, gave birth to two twins, and one of them eventually got a job as a security officer. One day, while he was on the clock, an older man approached him and started small talk. The older man said that he was from Upland, and Patrick's nephew stated that his missing uncle was from there too. Now, things were normal up until this point, but suddenly, the older man's demeanor became very disturbing. He seemed too involved in the young man's missing uncle. Though Patrick's nephew never mentioned his name, the old man surprised him by calling his missing uncle Sean, which was Patrick's middle name and the name he was known to go by to all of his friends and close family. The old man then started talking animatedly and proceeding to state facts about the cold case. Now, the reason why it was so unsettling was that Patrick's case was not very well known, and it still isn't. It got no media attention whatsoever outside of that one-off music video. So for someone so random to know so many things about the proceedings of the case, it was very chilling. Now, it's entirely possible that since the man was from Upland, he just knew about the case from word of mouth. But Patrick's friends and family find this hard to believe, as they felt that virtually no one cared about their missing son in the first place. So why would they care now, all these years later? Well, here's some news for Patrick's family. I care. This is actually the second time I've covered Patrick's case because it's just so bizarre, and his family needs answers. Sadly, the old man was never tracked down, and no one knew who he was or where he came from. What this incident left, though, was a very unsettling and frightening feeling and a wave of uncertainty amongst the Betts family members. Thankfully, in February of 2022, Crimehound, a YouTube channel covering crime cases, premiered a video on Patrick's disappearance at the request of a subscriber, an Upland resident named Stephen Ondich. And it even included an Upland City Council meeting in which Patrick's now 73-year-old mother, Barbara, and his sister Pamela pleaded to find missing Patrick. Stephen was also at the meeting and even presented Patrick's case in front of the mayor and other council members. Sadly, Barbara revealed that her husband and Patrick's dad, Dennis, passed away in 2009, and he too never got answers or closure for what happened to his son. It's extremely heartbreaking to hear Barbara in tears after all these years pleading with the Upland mayor to bring the Betts family some form of justice. Barbara even went on to say that she doesn't believe that her son is alive anymore, but she still wants to know where his remains are so that they can give him a proper goodbye. Can you even imagine being a mother holding on to this level of hurt for over 30 years? It's something that no parent should ever have to go through. Patrick's sister, Pamela, demanded the investigators use advanced forms of DNA testing and profiling to solve Patrick's case, as times are now very different and there's a high probability of cold cases reaching completion with modern technology. But the problem is, detectives don't even have so much as a person of interest, so they don't even have anyone to collect DNA from. But thankfully, after all these years, Patrick's case is finally getting looked at with fresh eyes, and detectives are even looking into different witness statements and new persons of interest. But as of now, no concrete developments have been made. Even so, this instance has bloomed hope in everyone's hearts and has proven that social media is a powerful tool in spreading the word far and wide. According to Pamela, Barbara's health is unfortunately declining fast, and we hope that she can at least get the closure her husband and mother-in-law didn't get. A lot can happen in more than three and a half decades. If Patrick is still alive and well, then he would be 48 today, and we hope that there's still a chance that he can be reunited with his grief-stricken family. After all, there's a solid chance that he was kidnapped by someone and raised as their own, but surely Patrick would have come out by now if that were the case, but it doesn't hurt to hope. If something horrible did happen to Patrick and he's no longer alive, 
then at least the family can move on with the knowledge of this terrible news. At the end of the day, the Betts family deserves answers. They deserve healing from the careless actions of the police, and they deserve to know why Patrick was taken from them. Patrick's case is beyond confusing. There were so many suspicious activities after his disappearance, but nothing can be said for sure. Was Patrick lured by someone and kidnapped? Did he unfortunately get caught up with the wrong people and become a victim of trafficking? Who was the woman who called Patrick's school, and how did she know so much about the Betts family? Did the owners of the pizza chalet flee because of Patrick's disappearance, or were they scared of being blamed by the Upland investigators who botched the investigation from the get-go? And was that old man's encounter with Patrick's nephew unsettling, or is everyone just reading too much into it? There are too many questions and not a single answer. We can only hope that after all this time, the Upland detectives can redeem themselves and solve Patrick's cold case. The Betts family needs and has waited too long for answers and closure. Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of True Crime Stories. I wanted to give a special thank you to a couple channel members, including Sabrina Toner and April Howard. If you also want to become a member of the channel, you can gain access to new videos sometimes days or weeks before they're uploaded to the public, and it's currently the best way you can support the channel and help out. I really appreciate those of you who have decided to do that. If you want to join, you can click that big join button below the video or find the link in the description. This is a case that has rolled around in my mind for a number of years now. I actually covered Patrick's case about three years ago, and it's certainly one I never forgot. How a kid can just vanish like this, it's, it's truly beyond explanation. When you toss in all of the other strange details and witness testimony, well, none of it even makes sense. My heart genuinely goes out to the Betts family, because I felt for sure that this case would be solved relatively quickly when I covered it all those years ago, and it blew my mind to see that there were still virtually no updates after all this time. I know a lot of you guys don't care for the unsolved cases, but unsolved cases are just as important as the solved ones, if not more so. But as always, if you enjoyed this video, check out this other interesting case I covered, and don't forget to subscribe. It's totally free and keeps you up to date with all of my future videos. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.